Salams, you're watching NewsClick. We're continuing our coverage of the 2022 Manipur Assembly elections. The first phase of polling, as you know, concluded with a high voter turnout, but also several incidents of violence, both pre-poll as well as on polling day. Uh, joining us to talk a bit about the security situation and the law and order situation in the state today are activist uh, Erendro Lechombam and journalist Grace Jajo, who have uh, significant, spent a lot of time working on the ground uh, across, I think, various fields, uh, on many of these subjects and have experienced firsthand the sort of intimidation uh, that that the people of Manipur, no, common people, civilians in Manipur uh, face from both the state as well as other armed uh, groups that are active in the state. There are at least three dozen active armed groups and the state has done its bit by adding uh, police and paramilitary and, and military forces. Of course, you're all aware uh, that the Armed Forces Special Powers Act is also in force in the state. Uh, now, the Congress, uh, under the Congress regime, uh, the use or misuse, however you put it, of ASPA peaked with 1,528 cases of extrajudicial killings uh, being reported, and, and Grace here was instrumental in the reporting of many of those cases. Um, in that framework uh, is where we are today. The BJP government came in promising peace, and today will have us believe that Manipur is a peaceful state. Yet, since we've been here covering the elections, uh, we've seen a great deal of presence of security forces, some, what some might even call excessive. Uh, we're going to be talking about all of these issues, as well as how students and other activists create space for dissent and how the state quashes uh, those spaces. Uh, Rindra, I'd like to start with you uh, first. Tell us about your personal experiences uh, in some of these contexts that I was just mentioning. Uh, my personal experience has been that uh, I identify myself with the uh, younger generation more and I'm uh, uh, outspoken and I read, I write and I speak against uh, injustice that I see in society. I, you know, criticize or I express my dissent uh, in many different uh, forums, uh, including on my own Facebook account. And so in the last five years, uh, I was uh, arrested at least four to five times. Uh, at least uh, a dozen FIRs were filed against me for simply speaking my mind on Facebook. And uh, in fact, I was put uh, to prison twice and uh, sedition charges, uh, National Security Act, all of those things were slapped against me uh, simply for speaking my mind on Facebook. So that has been my personal experience, but also I have seen my associates uh, and my friends uh, being put through very difficult situation by the present government simply because they spoke their minds. Uh, so that in a nutshell is my personal uh, encounter with this uh, particular BJP government here in Manipur in the last five years. Right. Uh, Grace, on the same subject, Grace, if you can just Tell us what your personal experience is. I had shared uh, news uh, with this subtitle saying drama from the assembly. And uh, they find the word drama problematic. And that's how I was stripped of my, uh, this, uh, this thing, my yes. rights to uh, cover the assembly on the last day. Uh, the, the link, the story which I posted was about the chief minister's uh, positioned on ASPA, which was uh, released by the DIPR. And, that, and from that release, the Frontier had used, uh, had quoted and then um, made the news. And, this, and for this news, the Frontier were uh, summoned by the Assembly Secretary since the Chief Minister moved a privilege motion against the Frontier. Now, when they were summoned, they realized that the real information came from his own DIPR and his own statement. Therefore, they were not able to pursue it further with the frontier. So it, it, was, it was such an embarrassing position for the CM. And it was that news link that I shared on my Facebook by adding the subtitle, Drama from the Assembly. So, and for that, I was stripped of my privilege to cover the assembly on the last day. But 
you know, this is not an isolated case. Uh, what is important to know is that it's not Irendro, it's not Grace Jajo or the other people, uh, Wang Kem, Chauba, Diren, you know, like, it's, they are people who, who had to, uh, who were picked up and I released on the same day also. Like, there were several people, uh, not necessarily from the media fraternity, but also from the student unions. But if you look at the trend, the trend is more important in our case, I think I would like to go a little bit to the history. So I'm someone who was born in the mid 70s. Uh, so we grew up within this uh, political dichotomy of on one side, we have this uh, political, uh, ugly political history of annexation, annexation and the Naga saying that we have never consent to being Indians. So we have the political struggles within. And on the other side, we have this Indian with uh, you, uh, using all their military mights to suppress the political struggles in these areas. So therefore, we have this very powerful two forces operating in our spaces. And uh, the, in, the Indian military might is again like more empowered by the impunity under Armed Force Special Power Act. So we grew up within those, you know, within those like suppressions of rights on all fronts. Maybe for the Indian media, it picked when 100, uh, 1528 cases were registered in Supreme Court by HRA, uh, through, uh, H by HRA and IFAM, uh, through their like very, very consistent and like uh, excellent uh, rec uh, this, the documentation of this 1528 cases. Uh, so that's when like uh, the whole country walked up to the reality on this front. So uh, so it picked during the Congress. And uh, the BJP came to the picture saying like, you know, we will will be everything which, uh, which is not the Congress. So they are like, you know, the new fresh political party who will be ushering in the peace and development in the in the state. So there was a lot of hope like uh, in the 2017 campaign, like uh, among the people, among the voters, among the electors. So, but when they came, uh, the space for dissent was just, uh, what, uh, not just minimized, but um, completely squashed. So it is that thing which is problematic because um, without that, like, you know, um, how would we operate as media persons? How would, if our reporting, if our reporting is uncomfortable to them, uh, then how would we report their performance if, if there is that kind of intimidation, you know, if there is that kind of a, a message threat or a confrontation, then how would we operate within these spaces? Right. Uh, Indra, based on some of that background that Grace has just given us, uh, over the past five years, how do you see things having changed? And we are currently in the middle of an election cycle. Uh, so what kind of impact do you think this will have from an electoral point of view? Manipur's electoral uh, dynamic is very different from, let's say, Mumbai or Delhi, uh, because uh, economically, Manipur still uh, ranks among the poorest states uh, in India. And so a lot of uh, ele electoral decisions uh, by the electorate is uh, decided by um, economic uh, incentives and uh, mainly, you know, uh, financial incentives are provided uh, for a very, very poor electorate. And so uh, the issue based elections or principal ideology based elections uh, truly democratic elections are very rare um, in all the 60 constituencies here in Manipur. So a lot of it is decided by economic factors. And uh, we are sort of like very unfortunate that, especially here in uh, urban areas like Imphal, uh, candidates are elected based on how much money uh, they're able to shell out to each voters. Um, and that proves the point that Imphal is one of the poorest urban areas in India. As long as those poverty issues remain among the electorate, I don't think that we could truly have democratic elections here uh, because uh, votes are bought very easily, which is a very unfortunate state of affairs. And so issues uh, and, uh, you know, manifestos, everything from all political party, 
um, it's just like a lip service. And if you look at the financial assets of all these candidates, you'll see that they're like one crore rich or two crore rich, three crore rich, but they're able to distribute five crores during the elections. So the obvious answer is that they have a lot of black money. And where, where are all this black money coming from in Manipur? And I believe all this black money is coming from illegal activities. For example, uh, you know, drug trafficking. Uh, Manipur happens to be in a very strategic, uh, you know, uh, geographic location. And so uh, every now and then you hear that so many crores worth of drugs uh, was caught by the police or was caught by the paramilitary or the army. And so I feel that we are very unfortunate that we are in a position where we facilitate the, the traffic of these drugs, but at the same time, our generation, uh, you know, uh, new generation included, uh, destroyed by, you know, insurgency, poverty, unemployment, and uh, drugs. And so, so long as we are able to address these things, this, uh, I don't think we can have issue-based, uh, you know, elections uh, in Manipur. I, education also is something that I think probably plays a critical role in that. And, and Grace, I'll ask you a short question on that in a minute. But uh, before that, Elindro, if we can just continue on that theme. Uh, since you said you do identify with the younger uh, generations of Manipur, uh, and you've been in, involved with student activism and protests and things like that, uh, tell us about what happened recently at uh, Manipur University with the vice chancellor's misappropriation case and the protests that followed. Yeah, I think uh, most people probably in Manipur already forgot about that incident because, you, you know, people in general, uh, you know, have amnesia about these things. Uh, basically, the students accused the vice chancellor for misappropriation of funds uh, and other things, uh, you know, other issues were there inside the university. And so the students protested. Uh, and demanded that the vice chancellors be expelled or replaced by someone else. And unfortunately, the Manipur government was very adamant about keeping this particular uh, person. Um, and the whole thing sort of like escalated to the point where professors, students uh, were arrested. Overnight, Manipur University was uh, completely militarized, uh, you know. Um, I myself was uh, hunted down by the, uh, you know, Manipur police. FIRs were filed. One of my associates was arrested and spent about a couple of months in jail. All of these things happened. Uh, and, uh, you know, an inquiry was initiated. Months later, it was definitely found out that this particular person was, in fact, corrupt. And so uh, what we have observed is that students' voices um, Number one, are not hurt, uh, were not hurt uh, by this uh, government. And at the same time, uh, instead of providing, uh, you know, a very conducive environment for education, I think the government, this particular government, uh, was sort of like anti-education. I mean, yesterday I went to uh, cast my vote, and uh, it was a government school. And it really broke my heart to look at the condition of this government school. It's right next to my house, right in the heart of Imphal City. I mean, all the walls, it looks like it was bombed during the Second World War. Yeah. You know? And so that is the state of uh, you know, all the government schools and colleges and universities here in Manipur. And so definitely, I mean, if the electorate is not provided good education, they will not be able to make the right decisions, you know. Everybody will be very myopic about, uh, you know, little things, immediate gratifications. Uh, we are unable to bring that long-term vision into our, uh, you know, discourse uh, here in Manipur. And so... Uh, I also visited a couple of uh, polling centers that happened to be schools and saw exactly the same thing. And I'll uh, just put it out there for my producer to add those... Uh, pictures to uh, yeah, yeah so just just to illustrate uh, the point that Erendro was making there uh, grace education is a field in which you've done a significant amount of work uh, in all parts of the state i think uh, particularly in the hill areas remote areas where you said when i showed you some of those pictures you said oh this is nothing it gets much worse uh, 
uh, just uh, elaborate on that uh, for a bit and also bring in uh, the angle of uh, tribal students and their agitations. Two decades it has been a very f uh, frustrating uh, effort on education because it's not, um, it's not the fund constraint, it's the uh, lack of political will from the government side, uh, which is uh, leading to this disastrous situation. In the heels, it's the performance accountability is non-existent for the teachers. So, and the performance accountability is not a big deal. It can be enforced at a drop of a hat if the government is willing. And that is what we have been saying, but they are not interested. If you look at the spending, the spending, I, I think the spending reflects the policies of the government. So I'm very interested in spending. So this time with this government, their spending on education in the hill areas is 5.7 of the total proportion. So one is, of course, we need more funds. We want the pace to improve. But we should also recognize that the pace in the hills and the valley is extremely different. And if you are spending in the hills, uh, which is 91% of the geographical area, which is 42% of the population, it's just 5.7 of the total spending. It shows like your interest to promote the hills. Uh, and the the when it comes to the students like now now you should also know that in school education up to primary is looked after by the adcs uh, adcs autonomous district councils they come under them now uh, the autonomous district councils uh, their term got over and there was no election but uh, well the pretext was given that it's because of the pandemic that uh, they cannot pursue with the election they were actually going for by election uh, for uh, uh, some constituencies here in the valley after that. Now, even after that, they didn't conduct the election. So then, so because of this uh, indifference to the hill population, the, the students went for an agitation. Uh, the old tribal student union, Manipur, which is the only platform for the tribals, they went for an agitation. When they went for agitation, uh, they were, you know, the government uh, picked them up. So, uh, so they were not allowed to you know, say anything against the government, even when the government was not performing. That was not the first instance. Even in the second instance, even if you look at very recently, the, uh, the ADC bill, uh, which was adopted across the uh, political parties, across the community, uh, the tribal community, uh, when it was uh, not tabled, the tribal student union, this old tribal student union in Manipur, came into the picture and they pressurized the government. They, they, there was a series of uh, democratic, you know, agitations. Like on one of the, uh, I remember that uh, on one Sunday, the whole villages, all the tribal villages across the districts, across the tribes, across the 34 tribes, one Sunday, everyone came out in their respective villages uh, saying we demand, you know, the government to table the ADC bill. So even when the demand was across the district, was across the political parties, across the ethnic groups, the government still didn't give a damn. They Then they, they said, like, they give a deadline to the government uh, requesting for a special session. Then they said, if they, this is not done, then we'll go with, we'll, we'll, we'll be compelled to go for an economic blockade. The government didn't give a shit. So when they went for a... Uh, when they started the economic blockade, the government used all their missionaries to pick up all the students overnight. Uh, 11 student union leaders from uh, all tribal student union Manipur, uh, all Naga student, uh, this thing, student association Manipur, and uh, Kuki student organization uh, Manipur, they were all picked up. Uh, and then um, even after they were arrested, they refused to give up on their demand. Mm -hmm. So then the government said like, okay, we'll call for a winter session and table your bill. So they signed an MOU with the government. The government, of course, didn't respect even that. So now, so now, of course, now it's too late, but even with the new government, whoever is coming to place, if this is the kind of way you treat our rights, then, mm, you know, the tribal's, might aim for something more, you know, radical because we are not comfortable in Manipur anymore, you know, with the kind of treatment that we are getting in terms of sharing resources where we get breadcrumbs of 10% uh, uh, on the average. And then and in terms of sharing uh, like space of uh, descent, 
So all these things are ex becoming extremely problematic. This intimidation on all fronts, you no, know, it's becoming extremely problematic. Yeah. That kind of uh, gives us a good good picture of, of the actual condition in the state across these various fronts, particularly what's being faced by young people uh, looking to build a better future. Uh, so my final question to each of you, starting with you, Virendra, is what are your realistic hopes for the next five years, whoever comes into power? And then race after that, you, you also the same. Yeah. Realistic hope for the next five years. I hope that uh, I hope that the younger generation, especially the young people, uh, educated young people uh, from both rural and urban areas, I hope they are able to uh, have a dialogue among themselves. I hope that everybody is able to share ideas, you know, whether it is good ideas or not so good ideas, because democracy cannot function uh, without dialogue among the citizens. So I hope that. You know, there is a space for everybody to come together and uh, discuss issues with each other. Uh, and social media, I think, is a, it's a pretty good uh, platform where people can share ideas. And I hope that when they do share these ideas, that they are not intimidated by the next government. Uh, it could very well be a BJP coalition government, but I hope that uh, this... Uh, you know, squeezing of uh, dissenting voices uh, is not repeated in the next five years. I hope that people are freely able to express uh, themselves. I hope that people are not arrested or intimidated. Uh, that's the least I, I could hope uh, from this government. And I, and I really hope that the government does something for education. You know, starting a huge industry, providing employment to everybody may be a very big thing, maybe very challenging, but I hope at least on the education front, you know, we spend crores and crores every budget cycle for education. Uh, I hope that government schools, just like how it is happening in Delhi, where government schools are overtaking uh, even private ones, um, I think that would leave a lasting uh, foundation for the state of Manipur. And as far as employment goes, uh, my hope is that we are able to develop a culture here uh, whereby we are not so picky about uh, different jobs, you know, uh, whether it is, you know, young people from tribal areas or from the, uh, you know, valley areas. I hope the young people are not very picky about jobs. I think they should be able to sort of like uh, have at least some means of livelihood. If we do this, Things I think we'll have a really good foundation for a, you know a better Manipur uh, in the next, maybe not in the next five years, but at least in the next you know thirty years. Yeah. Unless you give attention to education, it'll be extremely difficult because uh, difficult because um, you'll create uh, when you increase this out of school category and in a conflict state like ours. Um, especially in the peripheries, in the rural areas, in the peripheries, where we have the, uh, what do you call, the non-state actors in our periphery. Mm. These out-of-school students, their only option is to join the groups, you know. They don't have any other options in life. They don't have any other options. So, the, so we have seen, like, we have seen very young people taking up the guns, and it's compulsion. And the government, the government is creating this liability by not providing education. So education is actually the mantra to assure peace in the state. You know, education is not just a survival or a better opportunities. It's also the mantra to assure in peace in a state like ours.